Good afternoon. This is Valley Beth Shalom once again. And once again, it is our privilege to spend some time with our teacher, Rabbi Hillel Silverman. Good afternoon, Hillel. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Good afternoon, Ed. Parshat Shlach Lecha, one of the most compelling stories in Torah. Tell us what we should be looking for this week. I think we have two interesting questions that are answered in this morning's Sedra. One of them has to do with the time that the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Forty years. That's a lot of time to spend trying to find the promised land. Actually, you can walk from Egypt to, to Israel in seven days, eight days, ten days, two weeks. Why 40 years? And the second question has to do with the tzitzit, with the fringes. The Bible tells us that we should have uh, a frontlet of blue, and there is no blue in the tzitzit, in the talit. Why is that? What happened to the blue? Well, let's take the first question. The children of Israel this morning are in the wilderness in the Midbar, a short time of it, a couple of months, maybe a year, and they reach the border of the Promised Land. Before entering the Promised Land, they want to send not spies, but scouts, scouts who will look over the land. And so 12 scouts are sent in to the Promised Land. What kind of people are there? Are they well defended? Do they have weapons? Uh, how is the food? How is the climate? These are the questions which they want to answer. Well, they spend 40 days there, and they discover that the new land, the promised land, is a land of milk and honey. <coughs> a very wonderful land, very fertile. Climate is good, water. Uh, the problem is uh, that after they show them samples of the fruit of the land, and by the way, the fruit on a pole is a symbol uh, today of the tourist ministry uh, in Israel. You'll find uh, the sample, the symbol of fruit on a pole on taxi cabs uh, showing the uh, fertility of the land. But the 12 scouts report that even if it's very fertile, everything is wonderful, there are giants, huge human beings who live there uh, who can defend themselves wonderfully. It will be impossible for the children to enter the promised land. And so after 40 days, they return to Moses and the children of Israel and make their report. It's a very fertile, wonderful land, but impossible to defeat it. And the people begin to murmur and say, let us return to Egypt. Now, why 40 years they wander? Because Moses punishes them and says they will spend one year for each day, 40 years uh, until the generation uh, disappears, until there will be a new generation, because they will never enter the promised land. You need a new generation with spirit, uh, with hope, uh, with dash. Joshua and Caleb will enter the land because they were the two scouts who gave a good report. And that's why they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And there is a very interesting section when the people, the scouts, describe themselves as compared to the giant inhabitants. In comparison to the inhabitants, we felt like we were grasshoppers. And so we must have been in their eyes too. Uh, when we are insignificant in our own eyes, that is exactly the way people will evaluate us. If we do not have dignity and self-respect, then people will judge us very, very harshly. We were grasshoppers in their eyes, and so we appeared to them. Uh, in our lives, uh, we need not arrogancy and not bravado, but a certain dignity, a certain self-respect uh, as parents, uh, as citizens of a country, have neighbors, uh, as merchants. And this is one important lesson that we learn from this episode of the 12 Scouts. And when they return with their report, 
and the people are disheartened, disheartened and they say, let us return to Egypt. Why would they want to return to Egypt? Because there was security there. They had a job. They had work to do. They had food to eat. Uh, they had housing. Uh, they had water. Uh, when you have freedom, then there is uh, uh, responsibility. Then you have to make decisions. Uh, you wonder, how was it in the 1930s and early 40s, so many people uh, uh, were willing to accept fascism as their political doctrine? Why was it that so many people accepted Nazi, Nazis and Hitler and Mussolini's uh, as their uh, leaders. Uh, a number of books have been written about this question. One of them by Eric Frum. Uh, they were willing to accept uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini because they could avoid making decisions because there was responsibility in freedom and they were not prepared to accept that freedom. Uh, Rashi tells us when did they return to Egypt? Because they thought there would be a new idol in Egypt, which they could worship. Uh, Egypt was a land of uh, uh, idolatry. Uh, Nachmanides gives another interpretation. They would return to Egypt because uh, they would thereby repudiate the Torah, repudiate the promise to enter the promised land, repudiate God. And so that's one section of this morning's sedra. The other uh, is the tzitzit, the talit, the fringes. Twice every day, the prayer is recited that God commanded us to put on the tzitzit, uh, the arba kanfos. Uh, now, uh, observant Jews wear a talit katan, a small talit, under their garments as an expression of their uh, belief in the Jewish religion. Uh, let me return to my days at Yale University. I'm talking about a period of 80 years ago. And the basketball team, the captain of our freshman team, I still remember his name was a Guy McGahey. He was from a little town in Indiana. Every other family had the name McGahey. They were all lawyers, and he intended to become a lawyer also. Uh, I have memories of Guy uh, McGahey, fond memories. Uh, for one thing, he shot the ball with one hand. That was unheard of because in those days it was a two-handed uh, shot. Uh, also, when he would run up and down as the center uh, of the uh, basketball court, uh, he would never seem uh, to uh, sweat. He was white. Uh, we would run up and down and we were red face in exhaustion, but not yay McGahey. Our lockers were one next to the other. And I saw one morning that he was counting his beads and I asked him what they were. And he said, it's the rosary. He said, every bead is symbolic of another principle of my religion. And I thought to myself, I'm going to give him a lesson. And so the next day I wore underneath the basketball uniform the seat seats and the fringes uh, on my garment. And he said, what is this for? And I explained to him, it's like your rosary. Uh, each of the threads uh, symbolizes another principle, another ethical and moral ritual teaching of the Jewish religion. Well, that night in the basketball game, believe it or not, I made 20 points. I never came near to 20 points before that. Uh, I know we can go into a certain room at Yale and they have a photograph of our freshman basketball team. And there is Guy McGee and Hillel Silverman, uh, at that, in that photograph, I'm sure uh, the guy was not wearing uh, a rosary beads under his uniform, nor was I wearing uh, a seat seat. Uh, I remember one episode with the captain of the basketball team. It was Saturday night, and we were wandering around New Haven uh, looking for something to do. And there was a lot of noise emanating from a hall. Young people were dancing and singing. I said, Guy, this looks like a good place to go. We'll have fun here. He looked at me, he said, no, no. I said, why not? He said, there are too many Jews in the crowd there. Uh, I'm sure that Guy McGee never saw a Jew in his life. 
and I thought I'm going to teach him a lesson. So I took him one weekend uh, to Hartford, which was about an hour away. We went by train, and uh, we took him to Friday night services, and then a Shabbos evening Friday night dinner. And I can still see him standing there as if at attention, all six feet three of him. In those days, six feet three was very tall for a basketball player. And there was Guy McGay standing in respect, respect as my father recited a Kiddush. And so the passage in the Bible uh, this morning it tells us, Zachor, remember your talis, remember the tzitzits and the teal uh, techeles and the frontless of blue. Uh, now, remember refers not to the tzitzis, which is feminine, but to the pitil techele, for the frontlets uh, of blue, which is masculine, not feminine, but masculine. And so it really is the color blue that is significant in God's admonition to us. Uh, what happened? There is no blue today uh, in the fringes of our uh, talus. Uh, uh, it was a dye a dye from uh, a fish that became extinct, and so there was no longer blue to be had. The Talmud discusses this, and the rabbis tell us it was the chalotzon, a certain uh, fish, and became extinct. But there is also uh, a, a, a different interpretation. Blue actually was not purple, but a blue-purple uh, uh, was a very important color during the days of Rome. Uh, blue or techele purple was a symbol of majesty, uh, a symbol of uh, uh, and it was treason in those days to use that techele color and he, people were even sentenced to death, to death if they didn't observe uh, the rule. And so it's Professor Mordechai Kaplan at the Jewish Theological Seminary when I was a student who said to us, this is really the interpretation. The blue was removed because it was a symbol of majesty for the people in Rome. And he said, Professor Kaplan, when we Jews put on the talit and we look at the te talit and the patil techelet and the fringe of blue, it's the melech malchei hamlachim. It's the king of kings who we worship and we do not divert from his principles and admonitions. Shabbat Shalom. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Thank you. I, I never heard that interpretation of Kaplan's. I think that's very important. There was actually a, um, a Hasidic group in Tel Aviv that believes they have found the Chalazon, that it's back, and they were making... Um, they were making blue tzitziot. You can buy them now in Israel. So that, uh, perhaps it's time for, we have returned to majesty, and that's why. But thank you so much. I wish you a very, very good Shabbat. And the same to you. Good to be with you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.